Hi, and welcome to The Working Songwriter, the show where today's best songwriters come to talk shop. I'm your host, Joe Pug. Each episode here, we host a distinguished guest, and we ask them to go deep on their inspiration, on their process, on the general ups and downs of making a life in music. So, whether you're a grizzled veteran trying to write lyrics with chat GPT prompts, or else a scrappy upstart, trying to generate a free album cover with artificial intelligence-powered bots on Discord, this is your show. Because ultimately, it is what every writer seeks most, an ironclad excuse to put off actually writing. Hey everybody, it's the second Friday of March 2023, and I thank you for joining us. This week's show is brought to you by Banzoogle. Built by musicians and for musicians, Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. I'm old enough to remember when you had to pay somebody called a web developer to get a website made. And it would always be some guy named Alfredo who drove a GMC Jimmy with his ham radio call sign as his tag number. And who's always trying to sell you pamphlets about how the U.S. federal government was run by the Illuminati. And old Alfredo would charge you about a thousand bucks for a website that would be obsolete in six months. But it's the future now, you guys. That's not how it works anymore. We're allowed to have nice things now. One of those nice things is Banzoogle. Banzoogle powers the websites of tens of thousands of musicians around the world, from weekend warriors to Grammy winners. All the features you need for a professional website are already built in. Hosting and a custom domain name, dozens of fully customizable design templates. This year, Banzoogle would like to congratulate its members on surpassing $100 million in commission-free sales through their websites. The Working Songwriter Podcast listeners can go to banzoogle.com to try it for free for 30 days. Use the promo code TWS to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. If you'd like to hear some of my music live in the coming weeks, you can check out my tour page, joepugmusic.com slash tour, where there are a bevy of new tour dates posted all around the world, from Denver to Seattle to Annapolis, Maryland. Finally, if you enjoy this podcast, if you'd like to help it remain a viable endeavor for me, here's a couple things that you could do to help. First, you could become a supporter of the show over at Patreon. Patreon is a platform that allows you to directly support creative endeavors that you find meaningful. You just head to their site, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, you search for The Working Songwriter, or you search for my name, and then you sign up to kick in a few bucks every month for the show. Think of it as a voluntary subscription. A subscription that you don't have to pay for, but that you choose to pay for because you dig the show and because you won't miss a few bucks at the end of the month. If just 1% of our listenership would kick in the price of a cup of coffee every month, it would make an immense difference. So thank you to everybody who's taken the time and the capital to support the show in that way. If you're not in a place where you can contribute in that way, there's still a couple ways that you could help out for free. First, you could leave us a rating in the iTunes store, or second, you could tell a friend about the show. Spread the word about the show. The simple math on those two things is that they will help me much more than they will be a pain in the ass for you. Okay, I'll end all the harassment there. This episode was taped last September at the Park City Song Summit, so I think you will hear in the background uh, an audience watching this. It might sound a little bit different than our normal episodes, but I still think it really gets the spirit of the working songwriter across, and I hope that you enjoy our chat. Our guests this week are two sisters Toiling in the vineyard of modern folk music, Leah Song and Chloe Smith were raised in Atlanta before moving to New Orleans shortly after Hurricane Katrina to busk on the streets. They would form the band Rising Appalachia and incorporate elements of world music not commonly heard in string band music, such as congas, djembes, tablas, didgeridoos, and spoons. They've remained proudly independent of the traditional music business all the while, preferring to build their own commercial apparatus and often functioning within collectives. During a TED Talk, 
Leah coined the term slow music movement, which explored how folk music could function as a public service to the local communities that would host their performances. American Songwriter says that their songs enter new dreamscapes. No Depression says that their gorgeous vocals result in an enchanting and hypnotic piece of work. Pop Matters called their latest album Enough to Inspire. I caught up with them last year at the Park City Song Summit to hear about their musical journey so far. Leah Song and Chloe Smith of Rising Appalachia, thanks so much for being a part of the Working Songwriter podcast. The name of your band and its regional reference, it's not incidental, of course. Uh, from, what I, from what I understand, you guys had a real genuine connection to Appalachian music uh, growing up. And Could you kind of describe what music looked like in your household growing up? Yeah. Um, no, it was not incidental. The name uh, came from our kind of our family upbringing, but it came from a lot of, of moving parts. We were raised in a beautiful, quirky, working-class family home in downtown Atlanta, Georgia, right in the center of the city. Um, so we had kind of the pulse of, of the city in our backyard, and our mother got very, very obsessed, absolutely obsessed with studying the lineage and the tradition of Appalachian folk music when we were little. She had come from a background of jazz piano, and she was playing hammer dulcimer for a while, and then she started pursuing the, the studies of Appalachian folk music. And so we grew up sort of in her shadow, watching this obsession grow and grow, and, and, and seeing and witnessing her find her passion as little kids. How was she doing that? Because this would have been many years ago, so obviously it's not on the radio because it's by definition countercultural. Uh, but also we don't have the internet yet, really. So how was she going about this passion? Yeah, it was great. Old school tape recorder, you know, and she'd, and she'd find old fiddle players all across the southeast and, and rural West Virginia, North Carolina, Alabama, you know, and she'd, she'd ask if she could come and record tunes and she'd sit on the porch and hit record on a little tiny tape deck and learn all these tunes. She'd learn, oh, that's the Mississippi style fiddling. Oh, that's the, that's the North Carolina style fiddle, fiddle bowing. Oh, that's, you can tell that that's the same tune, but they're from Alabama, just from how they bow. So she got... Your mom was detail-oriented. She got saying. obsessed. Wow. And it was not her work. She, had a, she worked hard as a flight attendant for Delta Airlines, and this is what she did with every ounce of her free time. And we would just get hauled along, my father and both of us, uh, along for the ride. And... That was the other part of the soundtrack of our, of our youth, was kind of learning and hearing her screech through rickety old fiddle tunes until now she can play circles around, around any of us. So, Wow. And, but usually, you know, kids, they hit a rebellious stage, and like the last thing that you want to do is play the music. That was the fault. last thing we wanted to do. Okay, but, but now here you are. So, so describe... <laughs> Describe the steps in between. Like, what music did you listen to piss her off? We listened, uh, we listened to underground 1990s Atlanta, Georgia hip-hop with fervor, and it was the most wonderful other soundtrack of our upbringing. Um, and the two sort of coexisted. Really fantastic. You know, I believe very much that hip-hop is also our contemporary folk music, and it's the front porch music and the storytelling music, uh, especially the non-commercial stuff that, that has been so much tied to poetry. And so we had kind of the urban storytelling happening, and then we had the Appalachian sort of fiddle tune storytelling happening, both at once. And, uh, and we didn't ha want anything to do with, I mean, as young women, we, didn't, we rebelled very hard from the whole scene. We didn't want much to do with any of the, the family traditions. Our mom, we told this story yesterday on the same stage, our mom went and played uh, our middle school, public middle school square dance, which is the most embarrassing thing a family member could ever do to her young daughters, you know? <laughs> it was like, the Smith family band is here. And we were like, no. That's brutal. It but was then, for PE class. It was for, like, exercise. <laughs> 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 and they brought, like, hay bales in. You know, we were like, oh, my God, this is awful. <laughs> So when did music become something that you weren't just listening to your mom screech out on a violin at first or, or listen to, you know, regional groups? When did it become something that you became involved with yourself and became a creator of? When we left the house, 
when you left the house? Well, which, it's actually interesting because both of our parents play uh, old time music and they played for square dances and contra dances, which that made us travel around as kids and go to all these folk festivals. But our mom uh, sort of forced piano lessons on us since we were little girls. And so we took classical piano lessons for a long time as she was learning all these folk musical styles. And I'm really thankful that we have that piano background, although neither of us play that much anymore. We were like learning how to read music at quite a young age. And then um, once we got out of the house and past teenage years and past that brutal hormonal phase, uh, we started traveling. um, And we realized that something happens when you travel with an instrument, you're welcomed in a different way. And we felt like then there was this spark of wanting to know some songs from our mother and father in our community and share them. Um, And we... That's kind of what got it going. I mean, we also moved to North Carolina at a young age and saw a lot of young people playing fiddle and banjo, and our community was a lot of older people. Mm-hmm. So seeing like this kind of revival of old-time music was really influential for us. But also as travelers, like having a banjo on their back and, and learning how to pick tunes and, and meet people through music and busking was really uh, formative for us. What are some of the like kind of fundamental, or who are some of the, the pillars of old time music? Like, if someone here in our listenership hasn't listened to old time music before, and they got to listen to like three or four different artists, mm-hmm. who do they have to listen to to get a shorthand for what it's all about, in your opinion? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, one thing I would say is that old time music is hard to listen to. I think it's really, really alive music, and you find its spirit the most if you find a community that's still creating it live. That said, there's incredible field recordings of a lot of the old traditional string man music. I think the music of uh, Ralph Blizzard is incredible. Bruce Molsky is an amazing, amazing musicologist that's keeping a lot of the old time traditions alive. And then the early work of Rihanna Giddens, who is part of a project called the Carolina Chocolate Drops, which brings a lot of, of awareness to the black string band traditions, is amazing, amazing collection of work. So there's, there's a lot of recordings, and you really get the feel for that music. It's a dance music. It's a living tradition. You feel it the most if you can find a little circle in a pub somewhere in the back corner of a small town and hear it live. And, uh, and you still can. All over can the you? Country. Can you really? Yeah. Like, is it in different communities that isn't like? Because sometimes, what, and this is me, I know nothing about old time music except people who went to Urban Outfitters in like 2016 and like, you know <laughs> what I mean, and like ripped it off. So, like, it, like it, and, and pretend to be something. But is it still a thing like in communities, like yeah. people work regular jobs yeah. and on a Friday night they'll go pick? Yeah, definitely still alive. It's kind of having a big resurgence, which is really nice. A lot of young people are playing. There's more festivals, there's more regional gatherings, and you'll see people, you know, merging it with other styles of music, and even the banjo is so much more in uh, contemporary music, so it's, it's definitely alive and well, and square dances and contra dances are happening all over the place. Like Leah said, it's mostly for jamming, so old-time music is for, like, sitting in a circle of five people and jamming, or for square dances and contra dances. You won't really see it on like performative stages yeah. all that much. We don't. We bring little pieces of old time traditions into some of the fabrics of what we write, you know, but it's, it's really a live music. And our mom calls it the original trance music. Everybody just gets in a circle, puts their heads down, plays 25 minutes of an A, B, A, B, A, B fiddle tune. Yeah. And then they'll look up, kind of look around. Oh, next tune, G? Oh, G, okay. Except and they'll a... start the tune, you know, put yeah. their heads back down. Just lots more drugs in the later trance music is what you said. <laughs> Just a lot. It was, yeah. A lot more mescaline. Yeah, I don't, I don't think they really needed any of that. <laughs> it's more of a moonshine crowd. More of a moonshine vibe. <laughs> but that can get you where you need to go pretty quick. Uh, you mentioned there, I want to kind of pick into something. You mentioned it's kind of an odd thing to say about the type of music that it can be hard to listen to. What do you mean when you say that? I mean, I think... Even as a lover of, of traditional string band music, and actually a lot of traditional music, I, I, I take a lot of time to dig into the bodies of, of old folk music from around the world. So I, I think a lot of the realms of traditional music are, are living traditions that had to do with what song you would sing at harvest season, what song you would sing at, at the wake or at the birth of someone. It was like a, a, a community spirit lifting tradition and, and old time music is, is just the same. It's, 
it's not necessarily what you're going to play in the kitchen while you're making dinner. It's, it can be long and repetitive and wonderfully rickety, and it is the most joyful to be hearing it live and to be watching it living. And I think that's the case with lots and lots of, of traditional music from around the world. And we could probably unpack it more. I kind of think that's where the folk realm on something like Spotify has become a little bit more of like a contemporary songwriter's uh, genre. And, and traditional music exists in a really different uh, realm of listening and studying. And it's more of a participatory music. I think that's where it really shines. It's less about what has happened with modern music around stage and audience. It's interesting. You've kind of mentioned two aspects of it, which I would think it's almost like you couldn't hold these two in the same genre, which is it kind of has like a trance and transcendental aspect to it, but that it also has almost like a liturgical aspect to it, where it's like the way that a church would mark a birth, mm -hmm. a death, a wedding, mm -hmm. a first communion, a bar mitzvah, whatever. Um, it, it, do you find yourself, in, now that you're composing your own stuff, do you find yourself trying to put those liturgical aspects into it as well, or do you lean more on the, the trance side of it? It's a very, very cool question. I think, and I'd love to hear what you nod to that, but I, I think we compose in one realm and we study the old styles. It, it's like two different chapters of the brain. That's what I would think about that. Yeah, all of the above and both when we write songs. I definitely like borrow from, as all songwriters do, other people and other styles and traditional songs. And we've written songs that we very much want to make sound like an old song that we know. And then we've written songs that we want to be a personal story. And I'm so thankful for traditional music for that like back road and that like context behind my brain and behind my songwriting because it's so, it's such a bounty. Um, to, to draw reference from. And so, yeah, all of the above. It's really cool what your mom was able to do. I mean, she wasn't someone just like knocking around in a library or, or just YouTubing different things. Like the idea of her being a flight attendant and literally going to physical places where the physical sound waves are coming onto the physical tape. That she, I mean, that is, um, that's a real gift that she gave you guys. She's the coolest person ever. <laughs> and her band is called the Rosin Sisters, so shout them out. They have some recordings, and she still plays like five hours a day. Our dad plays as well. And, you know, it's just really, it was really influential for us to be around a parent who had a passion, Both who parents. had something bigger than us. Like, our family was very important, but, like, music was, like, untouchable for her. There was nothing, like, beyond that. And yeah. that was really beautiful to witness as a young person. Like, our mom would just hunt and chase and spend all this time with music. And uh, it formed our experience and our, and our soulful relationship with music. Yeah, we were just dragged along for the ride. Now, but besides just the content of what we're talking about here, which is she was after music, what about kind of like the, uh, the character quality? Do you think that character quality of, of kind of tenaciously and in sort of like a Captain Ahab monomania sense chasing one thing, did that rub off on you guys in any way? And if so, how? <laughs> Great question. Um... No, I think that the bedrock of our upbringing in both, both our... We, both our mother and our father were both just immersed in the arts and they and they they just showed us by default that they showed us many many things but i think one of them is that your passion doesn't have to be your whole entire life you know and and that it, you can you can hold a working life and also pursue deep deep passion in the arts and and also uh, they both are very very committed to to just showing up at, at their studios in their realms of practice, and they still are. And our father's a sculptor, and he said, you know, I'll go to the studio every day, even if all I do is sweep the floor. Uh, that's great. You got good parents, man. We, have, we are You guys lucky. got really good parents. That's a really... Awesome. I've been doing this podcast for a while, and that's one of the best insights I've heard in a really long time. Mm. That is fantastic. It's um, the genesis of your band... Rising Appalachia, it happens like around the 2005 era. You guys have been doing this for a little while. Um, oh, wait, I want to touch on one last thing. Don't worry, this is a podcast, so I can cut out what I just did later. Um, 
I want to touch on one thing there, which I think is really, really critical. I have to remind myself of this, and I like to remind listeners of this. The idea that you can separate how you make money from what you're doing artistically. And in fact, as someone who's tried to make money for the last two decades making art, I can say a lot of times it's a freaking bummer. Yeah. It's a real bummer to have to make money um, with art sometimes. So I think there's a real wisdom there um, in sometimes in, in just kind of rendering them to Caesar, saying, okay, I'm going to go work this job. I'll go serve people peanuts and Diet Cokes on a flight over here, so that over here, all I have to think about is music. I don't have to make money yeah. off taking people. Absolutely. Have you guys taken that into your business spirit at all? And if yeah. so, in what way? I think it gave us a lens of patience. You know, when we, when we first started this project, we, were, we never said, oh, let's, we want to get there. We really want that show or that title or that, that stage. It was more like, okay, how can we build creative work that feels interesting and feels relevant and feels alive and if an invitation comes we'll take it and then if an invitation doesn't come we're not famished for it both energetically and psychically but also you know financially famished famished i think desperation can create a franticness with creativity that that you know we, so many people have talked about this week like what the music industry can do to kind of wring it out of you and i think if you take if you take that that sort of obsessive, starving, must get there tone out of art, you can start really listening closer to what creativity and, and the muses, we like, to, we like to follow the muses, you know, what they really have to say. And they don't really work on the clock. No. And often what they have to tell you, you're like, ooh, I don't want to have to do that right now. I'd much rather write about something else. Uh, yeah. But if you avoid it, then it's like a... It's like a chicken bone stuck in your throat. You have to you have to address it. The creative genesis of this band began around 2005. Was it a foregone conclusion that two sisters were going to form a band, or was it, you know, through fate and through happenstance, it just happened to go that way? Could it have gone a different direction for you guys? It was a long, winding road. Um, we were both had other jobs and were in school, and um, we were buskers, as in we played on the street for tips and, um, you know, in a very musical community in Atlanta, which I think was super valuable for us. We had a lot of elders who were musicians and who supported our, our growth as music. But, um, but it wasn't like, we want to start this band and we want to play shows. We didn't even really know what that meant because our whole community did it with other jobs. It was, no one we knew was a full-time musician. Right, it was wow. everybody's passion okay. project. Everyone was just doing things on the side. So I don't even think we really had context for what that could mean, if that makes sense. But, um, but we just slowly, slowly started to get invited to places. Like Leah said, it was very much a like one thing leads to another. Where are we getting invited? What doors are opening? And it wasn't a, a push from the front end. It was a, a response to invitations. And those slowly grew, but it took 10 years for us to become full time. More yeah. or less, I mean, it was like we were in college and then someone would get another job and then someone would travel for a while. And, you know, even when it started, we recorded our first album in 2005-ish. We weren't taking ourselves very seriously or thinking we would make a career out of it. We were going to give some CDs to some friends, <laughs> you know, and here we are. So I think our journey has been sweet in that way because we haven't forced a whole lot out of it, if that makes sense. It does. Mm -hmm. I, I think it would even be fair to say that for many years and many different configurations, one or the other one of us really wanted to get off the horse and not be really? touring and, and not be, you know, there were, m there were times when one or the other or both of us really were like, this is not, we didn't choose this path, we don't want to be, th this lifestyle is too hard, there's... There's other things we'd like to be doing, and I think the, the very powerful and very loyal support of so many people, elders like Chloe said, but also incredible fans and incredible team players and our ensembles. People, we would get letters written where somebody would say, you know, this song or this moment, you know, really changed me or, or, you know, please keep doing what you're doing because that perspective of the South is really needed. And whatever it was, these little moments where someone would say thank you and that, that was much more fuel than, than our, uh, you know, than our, than our game plan. It really, it really built 
our direction, you know. Can you mention a, can you think of a particular low point that you had reached and how you got there and what was the precipitating event to get you out of it? Was it a show? Was it a letter from a, a fan or a friend? Oh yeah, I have a sweet story. Oh, the little girl. Yeah, we, um, we had our first couple of shows after lockdowns and we actually fared okay during lockdowns because we all have other passions and actually needed a break from the road. So it was at a, a decent time for our band to just have some quiet years. But, um, but I noticed before we were going on tour that like I had been stuck in a rut at home and I wasn't being creative. And creative energy is very much like a, a cleansing element to your mind. Like you get out of yourself and you start creating and you kind of forget all your stuff. And so I was not there. I was very much in all my stuff and health and just the things that were going on. And um, we did our first show in Colorado and I pulled Leah aside and I was like, I think I'm just gonna be a mess on stage. I don't even feel like singing. I don't have anything to give, which I haven't felt a whole lot. Usually I can pull something up. And I was like, can y'all even just do the show without me? And she was like, why don't you just try it? And if you need to leave the stage, go ahead. And I was like, okay. Because I'm kind of introverted, like the stage is a little intense for me. But um, I got on stage and within singing two songs, like, I don't even know how to explain it except for if there's artists in the room, if you're in your process, there's like a, it's like a washing machine. Just washed all this funk out of my body. And then this little girl was on the side of our stage dancing. She was like this tall. And um, she was so vibrant and so spirited and such a sweet little like rowdy fan. And after we got off stage. She was six. Yeah, she was like our little manager. I got off stage and she was like, you did such a great job, girls. Like you just have to thumbs keep up. going and like just keep going. And I was like, did God <laughs> send you to me? Because like I've been depressed and like I didn't want to keep going. And um, she was amazing. Yeah, it was just like this little sparkle puff. And of course, the show, the show did it. And it was, it was just a really kind of simple moment. It wasn't even like some big thing. It was like, oh, thank God to be like back with the people yeah. and out of my like little corner studio in my house for two years. <laughs> like it's not that healthy for artists to be shut away. So did you tell the little girl that just oh, by yeah. standing on the side of the stage and telling you good job that she could make 15% gross? <laughs> oh yeah, we, we asked if we could hire her. Yeah, okay. we, we have a, a video of her and we were like, will you be our manager? And she was like, yeah. And we were like, can we pay you in bananas? And she was like, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> so she's a little friend She's hired. Now. But sometimes, you know, we're very much an audience band, if that makes sense, like our fans and who we look out at when we're performing. Uh, is huge for us and keeps us going it's 100%. Our soul food. Are you stuck in a rut? Are you tired of listening to that Jimmy Buffett 20th Century Masters CD over and over again and need some new music? Are you sick of making hamburger helper beef stroganoff for dinner every night and you want something new to cook? What you are looking for, my friends, is the Enthusiast Digest. That's my monthly newsletter, which arrives in your inbox the first Sunday morning of every month, bursting with musical recommendations, poetry selections, recipes and cooking techniques for my favorite dishes, and items of general interest culled from the vast cesspool that is the Internet. The Enthusiast Digest is free to subscribe to. If you dig the poetry that you hear on this show and the artists that you're hearing from, you'll dig the newsletter because I approach it with the exact same sensibility of curation. Go to joepugmusic.com slash newsletter today to sign up for free. That is joepugmusic.com slash newsletter. It takes approximately 15 seconds to sign up for a free newsletter that will enrich the first Sunday of your month with a veritable cornucopia of new and delightful recommendations. That's the Enthusiast Digest, the first Sunday of every month. Sign up for free at joepugmusic.com slash newsletter. The 
ethic that Chloe and Leah bring to their work is commendable. So many people, myself included probably, got into music as a mode of self-aggrandizement. Rising Appalachia's efforts to, as much as possible, keep their music in a non-commercial space is singular among the many artists I've met and interviewed. Some people just do things for the love of it. And this might be an occasion to read a particularly compelling Billy Collins poem entitled, I Love You. Early on, I noticed that you always say it to each of your children as you are getting off the phone with them, just as you never fail to say it to me whenever we arrive at the end of a call. It's all new to this only child. I never heard my parents say it, at least not on such a regular basis, nor did it ever occur to me to miss it. To say I love you pretty much every day would have seemed strangely obvious like saying, I'm looking at you when you were standing there looking at someone. If my parents had started saying it a lot, I would have started to worry about them. Of course, I always like hearing it from you. That is never a cause for concern. The problem is I now find myself saying it back, if only because just saying goodbye, then hanging up would make me seem discourteous. But like Bartleby, I would prefer not to say it so often would prefer instead to save it for special occasions, like shouting it out as I leaped into the red mouth of a volcano with you standing helplessly on the smoking rim, or while we are desperately clasping hands before our plane plunges into the Gulf of Mexico, which are only two of the examples I had in mind, but enough, as it turns out, to make me want to say it to you right now. And what better place than in the final couplet of a poem where, as every student knows, it really counts. You mentioned during the creative process the idea of being kind of like able to cleanse yourself, and what you talked about cleansing yourself was sort of this inward focus. And that that inward focus... I mean, that's just part of their human condition. I think in, in um, the seventh circle of Dante's hell, the devil is at the bottom folding in on himself. You know what I mean? Because that, that was Dante's idea of the worst place that you could possibly be is only paying attention to yourself and not involving yourself with other people. So here's my question. I kind of know what you were talking about, being able to kind of cleanse that from yourself uh, by being in a creative process. How do you do that, though, when the creative process can feel like very personal, can feel very about you. Like, how do you get into that space with something that on the surface kind of feels personal and about you? Great question. Um, Well, I don't know. That's a really good question. What are some techniques you use to kind of get into that state where you can feel that way? It can be very brass tacks. You know what I mean? Um, One thing that has really helped me is um, our mom, once again, the parental thing. She started a women's singing group when we were young, and it was all just harmonics and not for performing. And, um, you know, we're full-time performers, so there is that push and that edge to, like, create for (laughs) the people and for the machine. Um, But to bring the music back, which, once again, I'm so thankful for traditional music and for that circle, to bring it back, like... It's not that it's outside of yourself because you're still bringing yourself to it, but to just like get into the harmonics and the oral like texture of the music always pulls my stuff to a better place. If that makes sense? Yeah, it's like what you said. I mean, you're not. You can get kind of lonely in your own brain if you can just be in the act of creating in any form, be it a, a street dance party or you know a. a, a prompt where you're just trying to write a limerick you know whatever it is something that gets you in the space but but so often I think what we are struggling with now as a society is is isolation so often you you need you need the people you know to be part of the the process that that becomes the catharsis and you know with I think we're all trying to figure out how to put that back together you know and 
I know that collaboration has been a huge part of, of both your writing processes. Has that always been the case, or have you learned to do that better over time? I think it's just always been the case. What is, in your opinion then, what is the most important quality in you and in a collaborator? What's the most important quality to possess or to work on so that you can have a fruitful collaboration? I mean, I think that we're so, we're kind of, I don't know if spoiled is the right word. Like we have honed an entire craft out of only knowing collaboration. We, we co-write. We, one of us has an idea, the other one jumps on it. Um, and we've been working with a lot of other musicians over the years who, who are the, the head of their projects. And it's so interesting to see how hard collaboration is for people. And yeah. I don't, it's been plenty of tangle at times between Chloe and I or between the two of us and our whole band. Our band has been touring with us also, the same band members for 10 years. So they're a big part of our team. But, but we've never had like a, a single spearheaded anything. Everything has been a seesaw. Everything's kind of been this, this verb of balance. So you get like 80% of your idea that you really want and you let a little bit go and somebody else fills in and goes maybe a different direction than what you think it will go in. And it's such a graceful gift because it, it has a durability that I don't think we get out of singular thinking. Yes. Has there ever been a time though when one of you brings a song in and someone wants to change it and you're like, no, nah, fuck that, it's great. <laughs> going, and, and you go. Sure. We allow room for that. You know, sometimes <laughs> one of us will have a fully visioned song and it's like, hey, I want you to fill this part, but I don't really want you to like go everywhere. Right. And that happens, you know. And then sometimes we won't have a fully visioned song and we'll like ask the band to fill in. And I think the main thing in collaboration is, is like malleability. If you have... If you want to collaborate, you do have to like turn that off a little bit. If you're mm -hmm. stepping up to the collaborative table, if you have something that's fully formed and you ask feedback and everyone's like, well, you know, that is pretty good. It's nice to leave it alone a little bit. Yes. But we bring songs that are like one little hook is written and then our whole band is like, cool, let's go here and here and here. And it's like a democratic process. And they're both really important. Like I wrote this song, Resilient which is one of our more well-known songs, and it was just done. It was like, it just came out of me, completely finished, and I've never Fast really written like too. that, ever. Yeah. It was just like, blah, 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 blah. And yeah. so the band just, you know, complimented it, but they didn't change it, because it was finished. And you yes. could just tell that it was finished. Yeah, Chloe was, got off the aer airplane and was like, here, I wrote this little ditty called Resilient, and we were like, wow, way to write your magnum opus on a napkin, you know, just bam, right there, so. But what you're saying is you have to genuinely have that malleability. I think yeah. we've all worked with or, or we've all been the person that it's almost like a surface or a pretend malleability. I always compare it to like when you're in like second or third grade and the teacher comes in, they're like, who can tell me what is the most important part of the war, you know, the war of 1812? And, you know, people raise their hand. They're like, no, not that. No, no. And you're like, well, you know what you want. So yeah, why yeah. don't you just say it? You know what I mean? Instead of a guessing game. And sometimes a creative process can turn into that when when you won't um, give in to that level of malleability, you know? I mean, ultimately, it's the ego, and the ego is very loud, and we see the ego run away with performers, <laughs> yeah. especially in this country. So I think it's like a, a wrestle with the ego of like, well, what's more important, me or my collaborators or the, or the piece of art? And so, you know, we did this album, and it was one of our favorite processes. Um, we got together after not seeing each other, our whole band, uh, for like a year during COVID. And for the first time ever, we went into the studio and had no plan. Zilch. And we each started a song and turned it into an album. And we even like passed instruments around a little bit. And it was just like, we didn't even really know what, it's what was happening with the album. We have it here. It's called The Lost Mystique of Being in the Know. It was a concept album, but the whole point for us was like, let's try a process where there isn't a plan and where we really have to listen super hard to each other as, as collaborators um, without like a, a tight rope of where we're going. And it was so fun and it was so <laughs> necessary for us because we had so many albums behind us where I was like, here's the song and it's done or here's the song that Leah and I wrote and it's done. And that was just this free for all for our band and it was a really necessary process for us, I think. What was the hardest part about working in that way? 
Nothing was hard about Nothing was hard. in that way. Well, well, but here's the question then. But we then, then how come you can't just do that no, every but time? We, we had know? to earn it. We had yeah. to earn it. I think yeah. that's fair. Like, you know, we were 10 years in with that crew. Yes. Yeah. Uh, every one of us could practically ha- read each other's minds at that point. Yeah. You know, and I do think we wrapped that album. And at the end of the day, we were like, damn, we really know each other. I like, know. We really know where the other one's going to go, how to follow it, when to lean in to our, David, our guitar player. He's a subtle player. If you don't le- give him a lot of space, he won't leap. But if you give him a lot of space, all of a sudden this like noty traditional Irish tune would like come up like the phoenix out of the tune. And, yeah. you know, it would lean back and then Chloe would find some old piece of poetry she'd shoot out. And, you know, the, the, it had a lot to do with knowing each other, yeah. each one of us. And I think that's, that's also been a big part of the collaborative process. I think if, if even if Chloe and I were very driven about the exact way we wanted something, it would be more brittle. But it's really, really a pleasure for us to kind of have a, a rough sketch right. and then follow it wherever it goes. That's amazing, but what's interesting for me is for you guys going forward, it's like you earned over the course of a decade that record, which sounds like it was really fun to make. But then you can't step in the same river twice. Nope. So, so like, what do you do, you know, how do you um, kind of bring that esprit de corps and and keep, how how do you bring change to that? Like, what's the proper amount of change to bring to something and the proper amount to keep the same, and how do you keep that seesaw balanced? Well, it's cool. I mean, we've been, we're working on, the kind of early stages of the next studio album now, and it mm-hmm. does feel that way, like, oh man, that was so fun, and we can't, we can't really do that again. Like, right, right, right. We tried a, a little run of, of pop folk covers. We were like, let's do something radically different and cover a bunch of pop tunes, and that was fun, but it was a bit of a flop. Uh, yeah. You know, and, but I do think that something else that has been really a pleasure in in developing a lot of our, our working uh, ethos, for lack of a better word, is that we're not real precious about any of it. It's like, all right, let's just create and let's put out work. Neither of us have this kind of perfectionism. And then I think that years and years ago, we released uh, our first album and we were very eager and we were very excited about you know, making it just this dial deep, you know, mythological folk anthem and we wanted it to say everything in the whole world and we sent it out to all of our maybe 10 of our favorite peers teachers leaders elders and we gave them a survey of questions because we were like we just want it to be perfect and we gave them all these questions to help us pick the order and what is is this one best at this tempo or this tempo and we got 10 letters back from 10 incredible teachers and elders with 10 entirely different responses. Nothing, not a single thing was a common thread in there. And that was our first album. That was when we were just beginning. And I remember we sat down together and we talked about it and we said, okay, this is, there is not a right answer in art. It's completely your process. You have to find out when it feels done for you. And, and that's all you get. There is no right or wrong. You could get 10 reviews from incredible music critics. Somebody will love it. Somebody will hate it. You have to be centered in it. Mm-hmm. And I think after that, we completely released the notion of perfection. And it feels like we create a body of work that is a bit more like a journal entry. Mm. Here's where we are now. Here's what feels relevant now. Let's actually get it out quick before it feels not no longer relevant and, and see what else will show up. You know, if you, if, you, if you move it out, then you have a little more space. And, and so I think that's really allowed us some ease around like <clears throat> just creating for the sake of creating, mm. you know. You guys have remained on the business end proudly and fiercely independent for the last uh, 10 or 15 years. And it's interesting, when I hear you talk about creating, there's a lot of, uh, you know, the idea of spontaneity, rolling with it, you know, uh, this, that, and the other. I know from trying to make music independently for the last, you know, 15 years, um, you can't make a business run if you're not hitting your mark, if you don't have an idea of where you want the business to go. And if you don't figure out what your monthly number is and how you hit it, because that way, you know, the lights have to stay on. How do you guys 
conceptualize the business end of what you do? It used to be in a spiral-bound notebook. We loved the spiral-bound spiral notebook bound days. The marble vibe. Yeah, I, I miss that so much. Mm. Now it's moved to spreadsheets, which... It's a hard thing, I think, like, balancing the creative brain and the business brain are, like, very different spheres of the world, and we don't have a great answer to that, except for that we've hired some really great people to help who are professionals in their worlds, and, um, you know, we're still in the sphere where artists, musicians make most of their money touring, which yeah. we were really hoping would change during COVID and that the music industry would get creative with what else we could do. Um, but we still make most of our money touring and we love live shows. And so it's great. But we're getting to the point where we're like, OK, well, how much of this can we do and stay in, and stay sane and grounded in our lives? Luckily, we, uh, we do like enjoy the performance aspect of it. But the business, you know, it's like, you're right. You're like, okay, my, my last song that we made, like Leah said, this kind of pop cover didn't go very well. And then in your brain, you're like, well, shoot, you have to stop thinking about the art for a second because the song we loved. Mm -hmm. And we have to look at it in this like kind of down sphere of like, it didn't trend very well. And it's, <laughs> it sucks to be totally honest. It's yeah. really hard. And it's like, I try my best to put on different hats and when we go into the creative space to like turn the business stuff off and even give myself time on the front and the back end to not f do the business stuff mm -hmm. um, because they cancel each other out in a way. But we do still run it. And so we're constantly juggling of like, well, which, which wolf am I feeding? Am I feeding the capitalism kind of profit wolf or am I feeding my like really what I want to say and my vulnerability in my art? And it's strange. I suppose I'm more interested in kind of like the, the macro level at which you guys have worked at, um, and I've heard you call it in interviews before, slow music. You talked about this a little bit before in the interview here, the idea of we're going to take our time, we're going to work jobs for the next 10 years before this takes off. And so why, I, I understand in a spiritual and in an ethical sense why that makes sense. It looks like that's made a lot of sense for you guys business-wise as well. And do you spend any time analyzing that? And to the degree that you do, why do you think that that has made dollars and cents for you guys? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, we ran an experiment when we were... Uh, most of this has been an experiment. Our whole life in creating music has been an experiment. But I remember, again, in the early days, we, we ran an experiment where we would charge $10 for a CD. And then, remember what CDs were? Everybody remember those? Those days? Oh, yeah. And then we got to a place where we were like, let's do sliding scale. Because we didn't want to be sitting there making cash change for everybody. Right. So we did sliding scale, and we started realizing that most people put 20s in there. Because it just, they felt abundant. They mm -hmm. felt like they were given the invitation to be as abundant as they wanted. And I think that was the beginning of many, 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 many different iterations of us understanding that if you are if you if you are abundant if you give well if you give back well then then you're treated better and to be really nuts and bolts on the business although it is important we have a business manager who's wonderful and if 36 cents was missing from our account he would call us in tears and say 36 cents is missing yes so we are thankful for the people who who hold really great nuts and bolts brains which is neither of us but we learned in many different chapters that that actually having having a creatively giving relationship with the industry, with your fan base, with, with creativity is generative. And that has continued over and over again to actually like clock in the books better than any business people have been able to understand why. Yeah. And we couldn't exactly tell you why, except that I think if you move, if you move that way, if you move abundantly, then, then you, you reap benefits that are maybe harder to contextualize and harder to even make sense out of, but, but that are very real. Your invitations yes. start flowing in a very different way. This, like, on the tangible side, because I know there's people listening who probably run music projects, there is also this extreme push in the industry to get beyond yourself, as in 
hire big tour buses, yep. go into debt for a record label. And we haven't done any of that, even though it's been recommended to us. We've never signed with a, lab, a label. We've never bought all these things that a lot of people that are bands our size at this point do because we've wanted our bottom line to be sustainable. And we haven't really bought into that like capitalistic thing that's like, just take out debt because our parents didn't raise us that well. And so I think that is like in the back of how we run our business is like, well, let's grow and be aware of our growth without mm -hmm. just like going wild for credit and debt and big things and big buses and big shows and lighting systems and hiring 10 more people that we need. How much can we kind of like spread the workload on, on the band and on our smaller crew and like grow in a little bit more of a grassroots sustainable way. And that's worked for us. And it also works for people to like go the big route, but it was never our like mission and it never felt right for us to yeah. do that. And um, I think that's helped us maintain like integrity financially and creatively because we don't owe anybody anything and it's huge as an artist especially yes. a young artist if you start your career and you owe people stuff whew, yes it, you, you might not ever get out of that hole yeah well it sounds like in both those cases that you guys gave you're you're in a place where you're trying to get out of relationships that are transactional and i find i mean just you know as someone who's married, it's like, you want your marriage to go wrong? Here's what you do. You catalog every time that you did the dishes and they didn't. You catalog every time, you know, you changed the diaper and they didn't. And then you get really ticky-tack with them. And then you set your watch for, you know, four years and you'll see a divorce. And I, I think, like, yeah. what you're talking about right there is, like, you're talking about having a relationship with your fans that is not transactional, that's maybe like, all right, well, you gave me 20 bucks this time, but next time that you come to a show, in some way, you're going to get 20 bucks more value, and it'll be, I'm kind of talking, I'm talking a lot right now, I'm sorry, but <laughs> it, it, it makes me realize that, like, one of the main things that allows that to be possible for you guys is a longer time horizon. I think that's real. If it's a money yeah. grab, you got to go grab the money and you got to do it now. Yep. But if it's a longer time horizon, 10, 15, 20, 25 years, how old is Willie Nelson? How long has he been yeah. making music? 70 years? Uh, yeah. It's a different, it allows you to operate in a different and way. I think that's 100% it. And you know, every working artist will occasionally do a money grab and no shame in that. Sure. But like long haul vision is really different. And I think that has been why we have been able to still do this work and are honored and also surprised every day that we're still doing this work because yes. the the long haul was if this doesn't feel good and if this doesn't feel honest, yes. then we don't want to do it. And so we'd rather be working on relationships and ways of touring and ways of engaging and ways of writing that feel like they actually hold some integrity to what to to a future that we want to be involved in than than like jet set up towards some sort of very very flimsy stardom. Yes. And you're right. Everyone does do a money grab here and there. I just wrote a song for Halliburton's missile targeting systems. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh my god. Joe Pug everybody. Joe uh, Pug. <laughs> um Looking back, you guys have been at this for a while. What do you think, and this is not a time, I'll give you an opportunity here to, um, to not be modest. Uh, what do you think that you've improved at the most artistically over the last 10 or 15 years? What is something that you came into this game, needed some work big time, that you focused on and that, dang it, you are better at now? Well, mine's about as clear as day. I was mortified to be a performer in the beginning, like throw up on stage, pass out, freak out. <laughs> Just couldn't do it. It wasn't like a natural thing for me at all. And slowly, slowly, slowly with some training and some help, I just understood like the realm that I was stepping into as not something that was like so scary. And um, just really, really worked a lot on my mind to be totally honest because our minds trip us up so much and... Um, and that was a big hurdle for me. And now, for the most part, I'm comfortable on stage with my crew, and I feel like I can be, uh, I can give and receive, like I receive a lot. And for a long time, that was just a wall. And it was like, I can't receive anything from this space. I'm just mortified to be up here. What was that new conceptualization that you had to do? Um, well, I kind of did the thing where everyone was naked for a while, sure. which actually does work. But also, um, y'all look great. 
We used to do meet and greets after our shows all the time, uh, before our shows all the time, especially before the pandemic, where we would have a small group of people and we'd sit in a circle kind of like this and talk before the show and we would sign things and just talk about you know, some of our activist work and what was going on in the community. And because I like knew a couple people, then I could see them in the state in the show oh, when I was performing, yeah. and I was like, "Oh, I kind of know that person's story." And I'm like, I had context, and I had a little bit of relationship, and it wasn't like just falling into this black abyss of strangers. And that was extremely helpful for me. And how about for you, Leah? It's a really interesting question. I just like racked my brain. I think, I think what I came to is this notion that when I you know, I spent a, the bulk of my late teens and, and early 20s being really a, a, a rogue loner. Mm. And I still sort of identify as a bit of a, of a loner. And, and, and I think what has become this enormous blessing from this work is that I have not only learned how to operate in a group, but also really tried very hard to learn how to function well as a leader and mm -hmm. in, in a way that feels like my, my crew is well taken care of and that that's actually at equal importance, if not more importance, than my own sort of needs and tendencies to be very rogue. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of have, have started unpacking that in the last couple of years where I feel absolutely at my best when I'm being a very good caretaker to my team. And, and that took a long time to find and was very uncomfortable for years. I did not like being in the, in the van with a bunch of us. I did not like that everybody was herding cats and everybody had to stop at different times. It all drove me crazy. I was like, just put me on a train and I'm going to go for 15 hours on my own, you know? Mm. But I think that that became a, a skill that I'm, I'm really thankful to have harnessed. And now I see myself at my best if I'm if I'm doing a really good job with our inner team and also kind of steering the mood of, a, of an audience and, and sort of reading the room. And it's a place that I really enjoy sitting now. Last question. Your mom and dad must be so proud of what you guys are doing, right? <laughs> they have a good time coming to shows? It took them a they while. do. Yeah, they're great. Sometimes our mom takes our gigs that we say no to. <laughs> That's, I think, when she really got into it. For the first couple of years, they were like, no, girls. Please yeah. don't be don't artists. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't yeah. be artists. Yeah, yeah. And then we started not being able to get a couple gigs in Atlanta, and our mom was like, oh, <laughs> I have a band. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then I could do Chattanooga on Thursday. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Rising Appalachia. Thank you. Thanks so much. This week's show is brought to you by Banzoogle. Built by musicians and for musicians, Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. Use promo code TWS, the initials of our podcast, TWS, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. Rising Appalachia's latest album is entitled The Lost Mystique of Being in the Know, available everywhere music is sold or streamed. If before we meet again, you sit down to write, please remember, an expensive drug habit is not a song, a compelling Instagram account is not a song, and most importantly, reverb is not a song. So let all that take care of itself, and for you, just keep your eye on the song. <laughs>